just a second. All right, so um, this is Todd Atkins. I'm here with uh, Red Yard Moncayo, um, who I first saw in UFC 6. And, uh, you know, when I start out, I prefer to let people introduce themselves. So I wonder if you want to introduce yourself to maybe somebody who wouldn't know who you were. How would you go about Hey, everybody. My name is Rudyard Moncayo from UFC 6, competitor with UFC Extreme Fighting, um, Battlecade. Yeah, and, you know, you were in the early stages, like I said, UFC 6, Extreme Fighting. So let's kind of start out with uh, your beginnings in martial arts. What were you doing before then? You know, uh, I was doing Kenpo Karate in boxing. That's what I was doing. I started off early in Kempo and I stayed on there until about 18, 19 years old. And then also in between time, I started boxing at this place called the Jerome Center in Santa Ana. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Santa Ana. And then also I was also going to uh, the Salvation Army and boxing over there as well. Uh, so that that's kind of like my introduction to martial arts. Um, and Basically, I mean, I think like a lot of the guys in my generation, they started off with karate. Right. But, you know, like how long were you doing it before did, uh, did someone from the UFC approach you? I mean, maybe let's talk about how long you were doing it before the UFC became a thought in your mind as something to compete in. All right. Well, you know what? The way I got into the UFC is actually kind of weird. And... Um, I started with Campbell Karate. Let me just say on to that real quick. I started in Campbell Karate probably around six or seven uh, into, I think it was my early, uh, late teens, early 20s. And then, you know, in the meantime, I was also still boxing. Uh, but the way I got into it, I, I was at my girlfriend's house at the time. And then I saw a commercial for the UFC. And I had the weirdest feeling. It was just like such a weird feeling. And I saw... Um, Pat Smith, by uh, dropping elbows on the guy, on the ninja guy, on, I, I forgot what his Scott name is. Scott Morris. Scott Morris. And I just had this weird deja vu feeling. It's like, I'm going to fight that dude one day. I, but I was not interested in the UFC and, or anything of that matter. And, and I, I just shook it off. Like, you know what? I'm never even going to meet him. <laughs> you know, this is a, like a non-issue. And so... Um, like two months later, my uncle from Ecuador contacted me and he says, hey, there's this show in the United States. It's called the Ultimate Fighting Championship. How would you like to represent Ecuador? I said, what? You, you know, and let me tell my uncle was, um, he was the president of the, of the sport federation in Ecuador. So I, I was like, uh, well, that's actually kind of weird. I, you know what? Sure. Why not? Let, I, I will do it. So what he did was he sent me a letter, you know, from the Sports Federation, and it was addressed to Art Davey. And uh, what I did, because I had already been boxing at that time, so I was doing a lot of boxing at this place in Garden Grove, and it was called the Westminster Boxing Gym. I, it's, it was in Westminster. <laughs> it's the Westminster Boxing Gym. So I had videos and and you know videos of my fight. So I put something together. And I sent it off to the UFC. And I think maybe two or three weeks later, I, I had a call from Art Davey. But this is the, this is the weird thing. Sometimes, sometimes um, life wants to push you in a certain direction, okay? Because I was still unsure about this thing. And one day I was working out. And then I met Kimo Leopoldo. You know, and we just struck up a friendship. It, it wasn't like... It, it, it was just all the pieces were falling together. Okay. So I started training with him. And at that point, maybe three weeks after that, that's when our Davey contacted me and uh, had this message on my answer machine. And he's, Hey, this is our Davey with wow. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about possibly competing in the ultimate fighting championship. Uh, can you call me? And so then I called him and then we set up an appointment and that's just, how I got into the UFC. Tell me about the appointment. Like, what did Art say to you? I mean, he's a character. What did he say to you about competing? Well, you know what? Uh, he thought I was really small. 
I was a uh, hundred and at, at that point I was I think it was 175, 180 pounds. Okay, and what I had sent him was a a picture of a I had I had also been doing modeling. Okay, I was doing some modeling. So what I did was I put a whole portfolio together and then a video of my fights and everything. So he had this really nice thing. He's looking at my pictures and he's like, are you sure you want to ruin this face? Are you sure this is something that you want to do? Um, and I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's fine. I I'm cool with it. I I'll do it, Art. Um, you, you know, he was really, he, he was a kind, I, I liked him. He, I, I think, um, you know, I'd like to think he liked me too. And obviously he did. He liked, he saw something, he put me in the show and you know, but basically, you know, what got me into it was the videos that had put together my portfolio. And uh, from that point on, uh, I was just training and he'd call me to check it, check up on me a few, even a few times. And then I remember maybe it was a month out before my fight and he called me into his office and then he says, how much are you weighing? And at that point, I had decided to put on a few pounds, uh, but it wasn't much. I was only, I think, maybe five or 10 pounds heavier than what he had originally saw me. And he says, I would really encourage you to be at over 200 pounds for this. This, this particular UFC is going to have a lot of big guys. And I, I really want you to be a little heavier, you know, get pack on some thighs. And, and I did. I think I went in there weighing 213, you know, but it, it, it was a crazy amount of weight put on in a very short amount of time. Now, you said you had struck up a friendship with Chemo. He had obviously competed in the third one already. Right. So, so what did he kind of tell you? Uh, you know what? He, he didn't, it, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't a mentor-mentee, you know, friendship or anything. It was more like a, a, a training friendship uh, since I had already been doing boxing and since I had wrestled too. I wrestled in high school and college, and he also had a wrestling background. Uh, we, we just started training, and then we started training at this place called uh, the Thunder Center in Fountain Valley, and that was actually a lot of fun. Uh, what we did was we trained with uh, the Calvary Chapel's wrestling team, and some of those guys, some of the coaches there were Olympic athletes. They were Olympic caliber wrestlers that had competed, competed in, the, in the Olympics, and they were out there, you know, giving us some choices, I mean, some uh, pointers. And then after that, it, it just started growing. It just started blowing up. A lot of people started joining our, our training sessions and some of the guys there, you know, a lot of guys that said they were black belt jujitsu went there, but you know what, at, at the end of the day, they, they really weren't black belts in jujitsu. They were just guys that wanted to be part of what we had. And a lot of times that makes it funner because you feel like you're coming up in something that's new or maybe part of you're getting it on the ground floor or something that's growing. You know what? It definitely did feel like that. It felt like it, it felt something, it, it felt special. And so many people wanted to be part of it. And it was just so much fun. I really enjoyed it. I mean, we, I, I personally, because I was already very athletic inclined, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go work out, I'd go train, I'd go do my swimming. Then I'd go to work. Then from work, I'd take a break and then I'd go train with chemo. Then I'd go to the gym and then I'd lift some weights. And, 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 and you know what? It was just so exciting that all these other people started wanting to be part of it. And, it, and that's what it really like. It was a really good camaraderie uh, that we struck up with. Just all these different characters that, that would drop by. You know, the first time I saw chemo in person, I was in Hawaii for a number of years. You know, I was in the military and... Uh, he had just fought Brian Johnston mm -hmm. and uh, I was in a tattoo shop the day after, I think maybe two days. And he came in there with this guy, Joe Robertson. The reason I remember the guy's name is because he was like one of the biggest people I had ever seen. Mm -hmm. Did you know this guy? I did not know Joe. No. Oh, oh you heard of him or he was like I, a big bodybuilder have... looking guy, you know, just huge. Y you know what? Uh... Emo looked tiny compared to Joe. <laughs> you, know. Yeah, you, you know what definitely uh, I did not know who he is I, I I do not know that but a lot of big dudes wanted to come I mean we uh, at that time we were both sponsored by powerhouse gym 
And, and Powerhouse Gym was just known just to have like really big bodybuilder type guys. And there's definitely were some guys in there that made Kimo look small. And he's a really big dude. And I'd see him standing next to some of these dudes. And I'm like, oh, shit, man, those, those are some big guys. Um, you know, some of them, you know, they wanted to wrestle him. And, you know, so it, it was pretty cool watching him go against these really big dudes and, you know, just sweep him out, out of there. But it, it was definitely fun. But I, I did not know Joe. Now, was Joe Son there as part of those trainings or? Yeah, you know what? I, I don't have very nice things to say about Joe Son. You know, um, that guy pulled a gun on me. It, it, oh, wow. You know, I almost had to break his arm off. Uh, he, and it was lucky that he not, he was not, he wasn't able to follow me home. Uh, I was living in Long Beach at the time and I was coming out of, uh, it was either a record store or an electronic store. And I see this guy, I didn't recognize him. He just looked, it was just some dude that looked very disheveled, shaved head. It, it looked like a homeless guy. So I just, I, I didn't, need, I mean, it looked, he looked familiar, but I was like, oh, gee, that guy's homeless. You, you know, so I just kept walking, got in my car. And, and you know what? I'm so happy. I am so happy and grateful that I did not go home because that dude would have known where I lived. And what he did was uh, he had gotten his car and followed me. But you know, you know what, the last minute, at, at the very last minute, I decided to stop at this hamburger store and get myself some food. So as I'm walking out, you know, I see that same guy, you know, and, and he's in a car and he's like, hey, you come here. And then I'm like, I, I, then I, I see him, and I recognize him. I was like, oh shit, that's Joe's son. And then he starts talking to me, but you, you know what, he just, he, uh, he definitely did not, he was, he was out there. And then he, he reaches into his pocket. And so he, here's a driver's seat. Here, he's in the driver's seat. Obviously, he's driving. And so he pulls a gun out. And I go, oh, shit, that's a gun. And so I, I crowded that area. So his arm was stuck against the, the frame of the car. And then the rest of his arm was out. And then he's like, relax, relax. Just, I'm just fucking around. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. You, you know what? It, it was a real gun, but it was empty. Okay. But I'm like, why the fuck would you play like that anyway? Um, and then, you know what? I said, hey, hey, Joe, that, that was not funny. I did not like that joke. Uh, he goes, hey, man, I'm, I'm just sorry. I, I was kidding with you. I was just playing around. Um, he goes, hey, let's go hang out at your house. And I go, you know what? I'm not going home. I, I got to go to work. <laughs> And then I got in my car, drove around for a bit because I wasn't sure if he was following me. You know, I just, I, I just already knew, even when I first met him, he, you know, there was a little bit of a instability there. And, and definitely, I, I did not trust the guy, you know. But, it's probably good that you didn't go to your house, given what ended up happening with him over time. Yeah, you time. know what? I, it's, I, I just did not trust him. And, and I, let me, let me give you a little bit of back, uh, background. I grew up in a bad neighborhood, okay? So growing up in a bad neighborhood, you start recognizing who the bad people are. It, and, and it's not necessarily anything that they say or do. It's just kind of like the overall, the whole character, okay? And so I recognize, I, I recognize those traits in him and I could never put my finger on it. I never knew what exactly was what he, what he did. I just knew I, I could not trust him. Uh, so I think, you know, in that instance, um, listening to my gut just really did pay off and just keeping that guy at a arm's distance, you know, so I'm not letting him too close into my life. Now, I like to ask people from that era, that area, that California area that kind of mm -hmm. produced a lot of the fighters, yeah. Huntington Beach and the surrounding areas. Why do you think that area was so prominent? in a lot of things, not just mixed martial arts, skateboarding, and a lot of stuff. Why? You, you know what? It's, California's fun. They have all the crazy people wanting to do fun stuff. You know, so um, I, I just think uh, California attracts a certain kind of character. And, you know, like different channels, like Huntington Beach, Fountain Valley. Uh, you, you know, they, it, it, I, I just really think it's just the area, and, you know, like people tend to gravitate with each other. You know, so I, I think it's just the whole vibe of, you know, just California. Um, they like to do, you know, just things that are a little bit out of the norm. 
Okay, so you go into UFC 6. Maybe tell me about what was the scene like there? You know, not the fight itself before you, you know, right when you first get there, or you first arrive. What do you remember about that whole deal? You know what? Uh, personally for me, okay, I'm, I'm, it, personally in my experience, okay, it, it was a cool show. It was fun. Um, but I was more focused on other things. I was, I was uh, not too focused on the fight itself. I was more focused on partying. No, not, not with drugs or anything like that. It was just, you know, uh, it was just a lot of girls. And that's, that was, that was just my, my scene at the time. <laughs> you know, so I was more focused on hanging out with them, having fun, um, just having a really good time. As a matter of fact, when I, I walked out and I fought Pat Smith, I was hungover. I walked out there, you know, hungover. I think I had gotten two hours sleep. I was partying with girls, just having fun. And then in the morning, I'm like, oh shit, I gotta get to a press conference. And I just put on something real quick. I think it was just some green sweats and, and um, a hoodie from Powerhouse Gym and I made it to the press conference. Um, so those are the kind of things that I remember. And then after the fight, after the fight itself, it was more of the same thing. And then even after the fight after party, um, that, that was fun. You know, I, I really enjoyed it. It was, it, it was a lot of fun. That, that, was, that was pretty cool. You know, I don't know if you had heard about Pat Smith getting beat up on the elevator. I, I was there when I saw that. Uh, him and I were, were, you know, we had just gotten off the elevator and then Tank Abbott uh, just clocked him. You know, there's a lot of guys there and, um, uh, you know what, everybody's just trying to stop him. I think uh, Frank Shamrock was there. Uh, Ty Mac from The Last Dragon was there. Um, and, you, you know, we're just pulling all the guys off. You know, I, I think that was pretty, pretty messed up. Why did Tank Abbott do that? I mean, I had heard about it, but I never even heard what, why it happened in the first place. Well, you know what, it happened on, it happened the day before, right before a fight. And so I was warming up in one area of, of the stage area that they had us in. And what had happened was they had gone into some kind of verbal uh, confrontation in, you know, backstage. And, but, but that was it. It, it wasn't anything crazy. It, it was just, you know, some words being tossed around. Uh, so I think, you know, the next day, uh, Tank Abbott had taken exception to that and just cold clocked him. You know, and it was very, it was a surprise. I, I think they had seen us get into the elevator because he was down there waiting. I mean, he just, it, it wasn't anything like he goes, oh shit, there's Pat Smith. I'm going to go up and talk to him. You know, as soon as Pat walked out, he got cold clocked. And, you know, so that was before your fight with Pat Smith? No, that was after the fight. That was the next day. That was the day after. Then he got taken to the hospital. You know, uh, they they wheeled him out on a on a gurney, if I remember correctly. Um, don't quote me on that. That's it's, it's kind of fuzzy, but he definitely was not talking. And I I just remember feeling bad for the guy. So tell me about when you were going to fight him. Obviously, you said you wanted to compete against him. You had seen right. him compete. Pat, we're talking about. Well, no, it's not necessarily that I wanted. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily that I wanted to fight Pat. That, that's not it. What had happened was I saw the commercial at my girlfriend's house, and then I just had like this deja vu kind of moment. This is before I even like knew that I was going to be in the UFC. And, and I was like, oh, shit, one day I'm going to fight that dude. You know, and I, I just chalked that off to that's, that's never going to happen. You know, and then a few weeks later, my uncle, you know, uh, wants me to represent Ecuador in, in the UFC. And so those are the pieces that I was talking about. Sometimes life puts you, pushes you in a certain direction. And then I knew once I saw Pat, it was like, oh, I, I thought back to that, to that moment where I had that, that, that feeling. It's like, oh shit, this is where I fight Pat. And sure enough, you, you know, when um, they were drawing the fighters, I, I drew Pat, you know, so, um, and, and, you know, I ended up fighting Pat and I got kicked in the chest. But I got kicked in the chest because I wasn't ready. What I wanted to do was I wanted to work out there 
and just give them a little fist bump. You know, so my, in my mind, I'm going to go out there and give them a fist bump and then, you know, get ready to fight. You know, but he was ready to fight like right from the get-go. So he ran out and just kicked me in the chest. And at that point, once he kicked me in the chest, uh, he broke something uh, that we have this little, right here in the sternum, I, I don't remember what it's called, but every time I took a deep breath in, it was so painful. I, I, it was hard for me to breathe, you know, so I was like, fuck, this, I'm gonna finish this fight. <laughs> and I, I, I couldn't breathe. I, I was like, fuck it, you know, I'm gonna have to tap because there's really nothing I can do. Um, so that, that was that for the fight. But I mean, you're going against this guy. He was kind of, I would say, one of the early, maybe fan favorites, right? Because of his performance in the first two, and he was a bit right. of a character too. So, what were you yes. thinking going in when they draw Pat? What are you thinking? You know what? So this is exactly what I was thinking. Uh, I drew Pat. I was like, okay, I already had a strategy of what I wanted to do. Okay, I, I already knew that he could not out wrestle me. Okay, so uh, obviously he was bigger than me. And his striking skills, because you know he was a world class striker, uh, were, you know, my mine were weren't up to par with his. So I was just going to take him down, and then just keep him on the ground, uh, and probably just, you know, drop elbows. So those, those, that was my mindset. Okay, but the thing is, the thing is, when I, when Big John said, "Let's get it on," you know, I walked out there and just wanted, you know, in a in a sense of sportsmanship. Okay, I just want to get a quick fist bump and then, you know, then go at it. Um, but, you know, uh, I got kicked. So <clears throat> your next competition was in extreme fighting? Right. So then my next competition was in extreme fighting. So while I was at the UFC, I had met Phyllis, um, Phyllis Lee. And then her and I became really good friends. And what she had done was she asked me if I had any in any of my fights. And what I had done was I had made a copy portfolio of what I had given Art. So what I did is said, you, you know what, Phyllis? Yeah, here. And she goes, you, would you like me to represent you in some fights? And I said, yeah, that'd be cool. Um, um, I will do it, you know. And what I had told her to is like, this is not my priority. Uh, this is just something I just want to do, but not that I have to do. I don't really want to do this as as a career um and she goes well you know we can just get you a few fights excuse me and then from that point on um she called me maybe like a a week later and she and, and she had gotten me into extreme fighting she introduced me to john peretti and then with john peretti you know him and i ended up striking out for good friendship now tell me about John Peretti, man. I mean, for people that haven't, there's a lot of new fans today who don't know anything about John Peretti. This guy's is hugely influential. He's kind of, I know he's a sheriff now. Um, right. I, I don't know if you knew that, but John Peretti is a major character, but he's also someone who should probably be in the UFC Hall of Fame. He isn't. But uh, maybe tell him tell him a little about John Peretti. All right. Well, you know what, John. John Peretti, John Peretti himself is very talented. He's a very talented a martial artist, artist. He comes from a professional fighting background. Uh, and, and you know what? The thing that I really like about him, he doesn't bullshit. He'll, he'll tell you things the way, he, the way he sees it, okay? And he, he doesn't fear coach it. And if he wants to tell you how he feels about you, he'll tell you how he feels about you. Uh, and that's the one thing I really like about him because, you know, you know exactly where you stand. If, you don't, if he doesn't like you, he said, you know what? I don't like you. And, 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 and that's just it. it. It's just, he's that type of guy, you know? Uh, and, you know, if people don't like it, that's too bad because he'll probably still kick your butt. Yeah. I mean, he did a lot of things. I don't think people realize, you know, cause he, he is extreme fighting was like a, I think like a five weight class sport right off the bat. Yeah. They, they came up with gloves to use. He was basically coming up with the idea for what we're seeing and, as the UFC started to pursue uh, regulation, he had already long done that in extreme fighting, doing all the things that were needed in a way. Right. You know what? He is the first one to set up with the gloves and the weight divisions. Um, you know, so he, he was definitely think, uh, forward thinking on what he wanted to do. He had a good vision. 
And as a matter of fact, uh, Battle Cade Extreme Fighting is a prototype of what UFC is now, you know, with the weight, with the weight classes, the ring, uh, the, uh, the way the rings are formatted. Uh, he has the five, the five minute uh, rounds. He, he implemented that into, you know, into his, uh, his events. Uh, so yeah, he was definitely ahead of his time. Uh, very brilliant guy. If you ever talk to him, that guy's, uh, you're basically talking to a genius. That, that guy's super smart. Um, but, but yeah, I really like that part uh, about John and he already knew what he wanted. He saw the direction that the sport was going in and he just gave it that push as, as to why he's not in the Hall of Fame. You know, I don't know, but he definitely deserves it. That, that guy did a lot of things. You know. He was also using like a round ring instead of an octagon. He was using like a round uh, cage. Right. Instead of having the right. corners. Yeah, you know what? Um, that, that is correct. And I remember him telling me why uh, he did that once, I think. Uh, well, one, I think because the UFC had already patented, you, you know, the, the, the ring, you know, the octagon, but he could not use the octagon, I don't think. Uh, but he said he just really didn't want, he didn't want the fighters fighting in the little corners. He, he just wanted something smooth where you didn't have anywhere to hide, go in there and, you know, basically be able to cover up. He just wanted the action. And I think that was conducive the way he, the way he was thinking about it, it was conducive to, you know, an action packed fight. Now, looking back on it, do you think maybe a round cage apparatus might be better than the octagon or which one do you think? Uh, you, you know what? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I actually probably, you know, what? I'm inclined toward a, a round cage. I think that would probably be, you know, I, I can't really give you a definite reason as to why it's probably right now just preference, but I would prefer a round ring, not, and it's, you know, octagon, I think the octagon, you know, it's pretty cool to say, oh, you're getting into the octagon. It's the octagon instead of, oh, you're going to get into the circle. The octagon just sounds mm -hmm. a little bit more ominous, you know, so. That is a good point. So when you compete in uh, extreme fighting, was it kind of the same thing with you? Were you still kind of focused on the party life rather than the fight itself? It was definitely still, you know, I was definitely still fo uh, focused on, on the girls. And, and you know what, uh, John Peretti, he had the penthouse playmates there. Yeah. So, that was fun. That was definitely a lot of fun. But you know what? I, I just want to say I did not take Mario Sperry for granted. I just did not know what the caliber of Jiu Jitsu was. I was thinking, okay, you know what? I'm going to go in there, box him up a little bit. And you know, if he tries to wrestle me, and you know, if he tries to take me down, I'm just going to get back up. But in theory, that works great. You know, but it's jiu-jitsu was way beyond anything I had ever seen. You know, the guys I was, I was learning jiu-jitsu from, they, they themselves were at that time white belts and blue belts. They didn't have an answer for it, for what he had. Um, so I think the only thing I was able to do is just roll him over and then I was trying to get up and then he still just pretty much neutralized everything I had. Everything I threw, it was just instantly neutralized. I was like, oh shit, this, this is, you know, next impossible to get this guy. So, you know, after you have those fights, uh, what were you thinking as far as uh, competing goes? You, you know what? After that, I was thinking, you know what? I'm going to take this a little bit, a little bit more serious. Okay. So I did start training. I did get into a good crew and I had an opportunity. Well, after I had a few opportunities, my last opportunity to fight in the UFC was in 2005. Um, and I either turned that one down or that's, there, there was a few opportunities in between my last fight at Extreme Fighting with, plus, with this guy named Todd B. Ornithan. And then in 2005, I had a few injuries, uh, like torn rotator cuff, uh, knee surgeries. And you know, the last time I was offered anything was in 2005 with the UFC. And I just straight out turned it down. And, and the reason is, because what I realized throughout this, this whole adventure was, you know, fighting the little local fights, that was fun because there was no pressure. There was nothing, there was no, no, no commitment. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm training casually. I'm just 
training. There's no one expecting anything. So that was fun. I didn't feel any pressure coming from anybody. And then but once, you know, it got a little bit more serious, but like shit, you, you know, uh, I have this modeling gig three weeks down the line and I don't want to get hurt. I need to take care of what's actually making me some money at the time. Um, you know, and so I, I was always torn. It was more of a thing that I did just to do it. It wasn't anything I ever took serious. And, you know, in hindsight, I do regret that. I, I did not know the doors that NHB and MMA would open for me, which I'm fully grateful. It, it's just beyond my imagination what it has actually done for me. Uh, but you know what? That, that's hindsight. There's nothing I can do about it now. And it, it was just a fun time in my life that I just, you know, I very much enjoyed it. It's just, you know, I, I was torn. You know, like, like I said, I was ready doing other things. And then on top of that, I had my own job that, that I was doing my own regular gig. And I, I just couldn't leave that. It, it was just, you know, lucrative to go and make, you know, invest so much time into something that right. the dude wasn't worth the squeeze pretty much for me at least. Yeah. I mean, had there been more money in it, it, it would have been harder to be torn perhaps, you know, if there was significant money, but there was no money at the time. So it was hard for you to, to stay right. committed to it. Right. You know what? And, and it's not really that money for some is a motivating factor. Okay. But for me, it was a small motivating factor. I just did not see the vision that everybody else saw. I, I, I could not go and, you know, I, I just didn't want to put that time into it. I, I, I had plenty of offers to go fight in Japan. And I, I turned every single one of them down. I, I just didn't want that commitment. I, you know what? It's, it's not worth it for me, guys. I, I don't want this. Um, you, you know, I, I was... I was just right there at the cusp of, of my career. And I just didn't want anything detracting me from what I was, from what I really wanted to do in my life. Now you said it opened some doors for you. What were some of those? Dunce, uh, dunce, you know, it turns out that, um, when, when I did the UFC, you know, I had done some stunt, stunt work on the Power Rangers. Okay. I, I used to just keep that stuff to myself. That was a lot of fun. That was nothing I really ever shared with anybody. But what happened was when I met John Peretti, he's a stunt coordinator. And Donald Zuckerman, he, you know, the co-owners of uh, Battlecade Extreme Fighting, movie producer. So, you know, one day uh, John goes, hey, you know what? I'm going to put you in this movie. I think you would be great in it. And you know, that just elevated everything else, you know, with everything that I was doing. And he's, John Perry's the first one to put me in any, like any big motion picture stunts. So he, he, is, he is the first one. Everything before that was non-union, very small parts. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for him actually taking a, uh, you know, a chance on me, well, giving me that opportunity, basically. Now tell me about that stunt scene, because, you know, like I knew tj thompson in hawaii pretty well i know he's into that now right. um, frank trigg is doing that you know so a number of guys um just kind of tell me about it what that scene's like uh, is it something that you would have wanted to do for a long time or is it the kind of thing you would do short kind of like the ufc that you know what that that for me was uh it spanned a few decades okay but it wasn't anything it was always it was always from the connections that I had made. It wasn't anything I pursued actively, okay? What I did want to pursue was I wanted to be in front of the camera, but it turns out that I had a little bit of anxiety. I, you know, when I get in front of the camera, it, it just all this anxiety would start popping up and just, you know, at that point, I, I didn't have the mindset to, to deal with that kind of, um, you know, uh, feeling. So I said, you know what, I want to do the next best, best thing. And it's still going to, you know, scratch this itch that I have. And I want to go with stunts. So that's, that's how stunt work started. Um, but to answer your question, 
uh, with stunts, it's a lot of fun. You definitely have to trust the crew that you work with. Uh, in some instances, you, they, you literally have their life in your hands. But nothing I ever did, none of the stuff I ever did was, you know, you know drastic. Nothing was, you know, going to put my life in danger. It was just fight scenes, squibs, balls, um, just fun shit. You know, nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Falling from buildings. Um, uh, driving, you know, I did a lot of driving stuff, a lot of precision, precision driving for some TV shows. And, but it, it wasn't anything that, you know, I really wanted to risk my life for. It, it, not that it's risk taking, it's just nothing to that point. It, it makes sense. Nothing, it was just very topical, easy stuff. You know, fun things it, that would just, you know, you know just, Take care of what I wanted to do. But, you know, I don't know what the average person does in the stunt, but in the stunt world, so to speak. But as far as a career goes, was it something you wanted to do? I mean, you said it spanned a couple of decades, so that is a long well, time. It, it but it was, it, was it something you wanted to retire in or something that is more like something you do for a period of time? Like maybe like an athlete. It was something I wanted to do as a side gig. Okay. It's nothing that I wanted to focus on. Um, it was always something that I always, I look for things that are fun to do. And to me, that would have been something fun. Well, that is something fun to do. And it spanned a few decades just because of the friends that I made, you know, in it say, Hey, do you want to help me out on the show? Or we had this that I think you can do that on the show. Um, you know, we need somebody that knows MMA to put a fight scene together for uh, uh, there's shark, you know, to pick up, that's what I'm thinking about. And, you know, so it was just very small. I didn't really actively pursue it, but I did not act actively uh, not, not go against things that, that I wanted to do. So I was listening to them the steps. Um, um. What were some of the films maybe that you worked on that people might know of? I know you mentioned Power Rangers, but what were some of the others? Uh, Godzilla. You know, Godzilla's the biggest one. Oh, uh, and I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Godzilla. Time Cop. There was a TV series called Time Cop for a while. Uh, the E-Ring. I did a lot of precision driving. Uh, I did some precision driving for... The Fast and the Furious, um, you know, just, you know, a, a lot of stuff. I, 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 Godzilla was in Hawaii, right? Did did you, Godzilla, did you come to Hawaii for that? Or I know they yeah, did some filming there. Right. The Godzilla was there. I was there in Hawaii for 10 days. So originally, originally what they did was I was supposed to be an extra on that show. And then I struck a friendship with one of the, uh, and I don't know what he did in the show. I, I can't tell you what he did, but I got bumped up. I, I got bumped up in the show. So there's a scene in, in Godzilla where he steps on one of the soldiers. Okay, so I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a scene where he steps on one of the, shoulder, of the soldiers, but the soldier's hanging onto the side of his leg. So that was my scene that got cut out. Uh, Transformers. Transformers. I also did the movie Transformers. I was writing more cycle uh, in Transformers. But it, things are popping in right now. So what are you what are you doing now? Or what did you do after you got out of stunt work, maybe? Well, you know what? Like I said, I was always torn with what I wanted to do. Like I do real estate. I'm not a real estate agent. Uh, what my dad does, uh, what, what he used to do is what I'm doing now. He used to buy land. And what he would do is build up on the land. So basically just develop homes and then, you know, rent them out. So what I wanted to do uh, right now, what I'm getting prepared to do is just take it to a different level. Uh, as soon as they start opening things a little, uh, up a little bit more, what I want to do is just open up the chain of Airbnbs. I want to uh, get some condominiums and, you know, uh, one's going to be natural, uh, I mean, just regular renting out and then the other two or three units, I want to Airbnb them. And to see which you know is more profitable. So basically, that's that's just how I've made my living, and I've been doing that since 
you know, since I was a kid, that's been my focus. You know, so that's why I said I was very torn with the things that I did because, you know, it, I was in like in a happy situation. I, I worked for my dad's company and, and, and you know what, my, my dad was a little bit more traditional. He, he didn't really, he expected me to help him and, and I felt that obligation to help him because he's my dad and him and I have been really close. And so it, that, that was a, a tearing apart that I had told you about, you know, earlier in this conversation. Now, have you, as someone who's in some of these original events, are you watching any of the stuff now? You know, I went to some of the UFC shows, but it's, it's like a, a magician. You know, when you first see the trick, it's really cool. I'm not saying it's a trick or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that I already experienced it. It really has, it has nothing. I, I, I have no feeling toward it. I'm a boxing fan. I'm a kickboxing fan. I'll watch UFC. You know, I'll enjoy some of the fights, but it, it's not like, a, you know, like, dude, UFC, let's party. Let's watch it. Let's, you know, I don't go out of my way to, to watch it. You know, but I have been to some of the events. I have been invited to the events. You know, but it, it's not really anything that, you know, tickles my fancy or anything like that. No, it's interesting that you make that kind of analogy because, I kind of feel, I mean, I do watch because I do this sh podcast and stuff, yeah. but it is hard to really get interested unless they have like maybe some major fight that has significance athlete wise. You're right. It is almost like a, a parlor trick or a magician. You've seen it so many times, although I love watching magic shows and illusions yeah. still, but <laughs> you know, uh, you're right. It almost feels like, I don't know how to put my finger on you see in these techniques it's pretty rare that you see something you haven't seen you right. know especially if you train and uh so you're kind of seeing things replicated over and over again over card over card over card fights 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 i've never heard someone make that analogy until you just did it but it, you know i i felt it right away when you said that i was like this is a great way to put it you know yeah, man. um I, you know what, I, I, I just want to say, you know, it, it was fun. You know, competing is fun. I'm very competitive. I, I love competing. Uh, I love chess. I play chess. I'm a very competitive chess player. Um, I also play poker. You know, so every year, except for last year, uh, during the lockdown, you know, I used to go to Vegas, you know, because they have the World Series of Poker out there. So I would go and play, you know, in the cash games you know, with all the guys that thought they knew how to play poker. And I would always come back with some money, you know, sometimes a little bit more than less, but, you know, I always had some extra money when I'd go in. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm missing right now. It's just that outlet. You know, that, that's the thing, the outlet. I, I need outlets because if I don't have outlets, man, I turn into this mad scientist. I just get on my computer and, you know, start tinkering with it, start building things <laughs> and nothing has any rhyme or reason you know, to it, you know, like I learned Python, you know, there's no reason that I didn't need to learn Python, you know, but I said, hey, you know what, uh, I'm going to learn Python because I don't have anything else to do. Python's a, a, it's a program, just for those who don't know. And so I decided to learn that. And, you know, but, what uh, kind of program is it? Uh, you know, what? good question. I do not know what I would apply Python to. I just learned Python. I think you can apply it to you know, web pages, uh, mm. you know, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how I would apply it. I just know how to build, you know, things with Python. You know, so that, that's basically what I did, you know, through, <laughs> through the past year, you know, and then I bought a whole bunch of books to teach my daughter the same thing because, you know, I think she's in a generation where she can actually use those skills, you know, to build uh, small video games. Uh, Yes, small basic video games, uh, AIs, you know, and using Python code as well as anything else that she might learn. You know, so. Now, as a chess player, did you watch uh, Queen's Gambit on Netflix? Yeah, I, I watched Queen's Gambit, but it, it, it was fun. I loved it. My, my wife, my daughter, and I both loved it. You know, it was a good show. Uh, I liked it. Um, 
but you know, I just want to, I just want, every, I want to make clear, you know, that it's not a Johnny Come Lately thing. It's not like, oh shit, you know, Queen's Gambit, then chess. You know, I've been playing chess since I was a kid. You know, my, my daughter, you know, she's been playing chess since we can start holding the pieces. I've been showing her, you know, I mean, if you look through my Instagram, you'll see things like from five years ago, you know, where I'm actually teaching her how to play chess, you know, so it's, it's been something that, um, you know, I've taught my, my daughter, but I teach her for a very specific reason, okay? I want her to be able to think in different variables. I want her to be able to think and where she can apply it to life, you know, and look at, at different situations where these chess strategies that she is learning now, you know, well, she can manifest them in, in real life, meaning, you know, what opportunities would come up if she did something or what are the consequences if she did something, um, you know, so that's basically why I'm teaching her chess as well as other things, you know, um, as, as she grows up. Yeah, I mean, I worked in a facility like that the girl was in. So I saw so much stuff there that I, you know, kind of experienced working at a place like that, sure. you know, and also when she went back, you know, because you do have some connections with some of the, you know, as a staff member, you have connections with some of the kids, you know, they come and go, but a lot of them rely on you. So I could see why she was so attached to her uh, coach or her trainer, her mentor, because right. he was, he was more of a father figure than maybe she realized at the time. Hey, you know what? I, I was a little disappointed. She never paid him the five bucks. <laughs> you, know, so, yeah. you know, that, that, but it was a, it was a great show. Um, now, do you go to any kind of like schools like that where they have a lot of boards and clocks, timers and all that? Uh, no. Everything that I'll, I have been to those when I'm, when I wanted to compete, but I have not gone to school uh, for chess. I'm not saying I have a great chess game, you know, but I'm proficient in it. And I, I acknowledge that I'm, you know, it can improve, um, you know, and that's one of the things that did improve during during my you know, during the lockdown. But I want to touch on when I was speaking my my daughter chess. I knew what my limitations are. I I, I know that I, I know what they are, you know. So I hired her a coach, you know, because I know there's some things that you know, no matter how much I study, there's I'm you know I know the concept, but I just cannot play as well as you know, somebody that has an international championship or, a, you know, local championship, you know, I, I know my chess is pretty good, you know, but, you know, I know that I, I would need help in that area. So that's why I hired coaches for my daughter. And, and it's in those concepts where the teaching life lesson comes in, where, where she can apply it, you know, she can apply the concepts that she learned, you know, and apply that in life. You know, I, I just want her to, have opportunities and recognize opportunities when, when they approach. And I, I think chess is a great metaphor for life. It just really helps you, you know, broaden your thinking. Yeah, I was traveling to Colorado Springs. I live in Oklahoma and I was traveling to Kansas and there's a little town called Lensbury there. I guess it's some Swedish settlers that originally settled there, but it's tiny. It's a little nothing town. And I went there, but on the main street, there was one of these chess academies like that. Some Russian guy was running it, had his name up on the, and I could see all the boards in there. It wasn't open at the time, but I could see all his clocks and all his boards. This was several years ago, but I thought what a strange place for this place to be, you know, this, <laughs> this chess school bad. to be, you know? So yeah, it just came to my mind when you mentioned that. I wonder if you had ever been in one of those places. It's just a random chess house, <laughs> you know, a dark, dinky room with a lot of chess boards on the on the floor. There's a chess, there's a place like that by 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 my home. Uh, unfortunately, I have not gone there yet. Uh, when I when I did start wanting to go there, it was right before COVID, and I think right after that, it's like I saw it one week and I said, you know what, I'm gonna go there. I'm I'm gonna go and and play there and take some lessons from this guy. And, and I think the next week, lockdown. I was like, oh. Oh yeah, yeah, you know, but the guy's still there. Now, how are in California? Are they have they opened yet? Uh, you, you know what? 
I am not clear on the rules with what is going on because uh, I think if you have the vaccine, yeah, you know what? Most of the stuff is open. A lot of the stuff is open. Outdoor dining, uh, indoor dining. You can wear a mask if you're vaccinated, but they're encouraging you to wear a mask regardless if you're vaccinated or not. Um, you know, but yeah, a lot of the stuff are open. Uh, so yes, you know, California is open again. I just haven't ventured out into a lot of places. You know, every, I, I'm still doing the same thing. I still go hiking and to the park and stuff like that. I really haven't gone to the movies or I haven't gone out to a restaurant yet, nothing like that. Um, and, you know, but uh, California, I think it's pretty open. Some of the jujitsu academies are closed. Uh, some of them are open. Uh, some of them stayed open during COVID, you know, training in secret. I got invited to a lot of those and just, you know, said, you know what, I don't know enough about what's going on to have a safe and informed decision on your invitation, you know, so I would just respectfully decline. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about, uh, I was trying to remember, you know, having competed in the UFC and done the things you've done, sure. maybe as we're kind of wrapping up this interview, what do you think is something that, I don't know, I always like people to maybe have something that they feel might be important to pass on to someone that's listening to this or watching it. Yeah, you know what? Uh, are you talking about for new generation fighters for the next, for the... Just, just anything in general. It could be new generation fighters or just people in general. So through your experiences, you've had a lot of different experiences. Well, you know what? If, you, if any of the guys, they want to be fighters, I would really, I would really recommend have health insurance even if it's basic health insurance, uh, get yourself some basic negotiation skills. That way you negotiate a, you know, a good pay, uh, paycheck or payday and you're not taken advantage of. Um, and then also, you know what, take care of your credit. <laughs> that's, that's basically it, yeah. If you have good credit, the bank will always throw money at you. If you have good negotiation skills, you can always negotiate for a higher paycheck. And you know what, uh, and if you have good insurance, if you get hurt, you know what, you're, you'll be taken care of. So those are the three, three, the three things. I sure remember one to, what I wanted to ask you now, because you were mentioning about real estate and stuff. What do you think sure. about the housing situation? I know this is talked about a lot where these real estate agents hardly have any houses to sell. I mean, it's, you know, it's the houses are selling for a lot more than they're worth. What, you probably have some knowledge on this. Yeah, you know what, uh, definitely right now, it's, it's really hard. It, it's really hard to find something at a reasonable price. My wife and I, we were looking at, and, and, and you know what, it's, it, it's ridiculous. We, we wanted to get out of the place that we're at right now. And you know what, it, it's next to impossible. And there's no way, there's absolutely no way that I'm going to be paying, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars more for something that I know it's not worth that. It, it's just crazy. I, there, it, there's nothing it's not anything that I want to do. So what we're going to do with the next best thing is that we're doing right now is just to take advantage of this, you know, situation. And what I want to look at condominium complexes and live in one of the condominiums and, you know, just, you, you know, what I totally, I'm probably not making sense what I just said, but we're looking to move. That's basically it, but we're not going to pay a um, random number, a million bucks for a home or close to a million bucks for a home where I know it's not worth it. That for just a little bit more, I can get something that's a lot more, you know, so a little bit more money, I can get a lot more for than what I would be paying for a random home right now. So that's, that's my take on that. But where do you see this going as someone who's kind of in that world as far as your, what you're doing? You, what do you, know, you see I, this I, housing situation going? I, I see it, it's, what's going to happen or what I think is going to happen, the same thing that happened last time. Okay. Uh, everything's going to even out and then the prices are just going to drop. That, that's it. I mean, it's just secular. That's just what happens. Prices go up and they go down. Okay. They'll be a little bit more expensive than what they were the last time, you know, but you know, they'll, they'll become a little bit more affordable right now. Uh, Everybody's just, you know, trying to get their hands on whatever they can. So people are taking advantage of that situation. Uh, Why are they I, doing it? 
Why? You know what? I, I have no idea. I, I really don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just human nature. You know, if, uh, sometimes people see an opportunity and they can make a little bit more money. They don't care, you know, who they take that opportunity out on. It's, you know, if you can get paid, if you have a home and it's really worth, let's say 500,000, but you can sell it for 900,000, you know, you know, you're going to have that $400,000 profit. And I think 99% of the people would probably go with that. You know, I, I would certainly go with that if I were selling, you know, what I have, you know, I, I would certainly go in that direction, but I'm not going in that direction. Uh, so currently it's not something I would do, you know, and I wouldn't gouge somebody like that anyway. You know, I would look to make a profit. But this buying craze kind of started when the pandemic started, right? So I was kind of wondering why that was, or maybe why you think that was. I really don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I just think this whole last year has been crazy. A lot of crazy things have happened. And I, I, I really don't know. I, I couldn't put any rhyme or reason to why that specific situation is, is happening. Yeah, I, I, I really do not know. Now, how crazy it is, is it at a place like, I know you said it's real crazy in California, but maybe some of these areas like where these celebrities are, is it just as big a problem up there? I mean, I would imagine so. I've been reading the news that some of these celebrities have been wanting to get out of, out of California and move to maybe somewhere like Florida, but they can't sell their home because it's, <laughs> you know, it's just so crazy. You know, a home that would, not, that would normally sell maybe for um, seven, eight, nine, ten million. You know, they're trying to sell it for 30, 35, you know, upwards of $20 million. Uh, you, you know, I, I think a lot of that, those things are a little ridiculous. You know, but um, I mean, I, I don't know what the situation with the homes are. Plus, they'd have to buy another one, which seems to be a, a difficult for people to do right now. Like, no one can buy a house. You know, it's hard to find. You, you cannot buy a house. You know, I mean, you can sell your house and then go buy somewhere else. You, you know, that that's another option for people that you own in California. Like, for example, Florida, you know, that, that upward trend is just barely catching up over there. I was looking to get some condominiums over there. Um, and then when I first started looking, they, you know, they were at the price that I wanted. And then when I was finally ready to pull the trigger, they're like 40, 50 grand more than what I wanted, wanted to pay, you know, for the same thing. I'm like, you know what, forget that. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to take a different route here. So. Well, you know, I really want to thank you for taking the time to do this. You know, I thought it was really cool to talk to you and was, you had a lot of interesting insight. Um, Maybe what's one other thing you might want to leave as far? I know you talked about fighters getting insurance and stuff like that, but maybe something you wanted to end the interview on. Or maybe where people can find you if they're interested in doing that as well. You know what? You can always find me on Facebook. Um, you know, just type in Redrid Moncayo on Facebook. You'll you'll find me there or on Instagram. Uh, Darth Jitsu on Instagram. Um, I mean, I, I don't really have any words of wisdom to... to uh, you know, leave anybody. The only thing I can say, you know, is whatever you do is just give it your hundred percent. I know some days, you know, you might be sick and your hundred percent is not going to look the same as when you're healthy or when you're feeling good, but you know, just every, everything that you do, just put effort into it. You know, just do your best. And, you know, I'm just going to end on, that's what I teach my daughter. You know, I know some days, she, you know, she might be sick, and her 100% might not be the same as when, you know, she's feeling 100%, you know, healthy. You know, just always do your best, you know, and it, it really pays off. It just, you know, put effort into the things that you do. Because all those things that you do just really do pay off. You might not see the short-term gain on it, but there will definitely be a long-term gain on, on that effort put. Well, again, Roger, I, I really appreciate you taking time to do this and, uh, Maybe we could catch up sometime if you happen to watch an event or something, or we had something to discuss. I don't know. Do you watch like Conor McGregor or any of these people that are around now? Yeah. You know what? I, I think Conor's great. <laughs> you know, I like him. Uh, you know, who's really, who really kind of fired me up is uh, Jake Paul. Uh, have, have you heard the stuff that he's been saying? Yeah. Let's talk about this a little bit. We'll, we'll end it on that. So Jake Paul, you know, you have the thriller. What, you know, I've seen Dan White getting upset about this stuff, so maybe it 
it's catching traction because usually he doesn't yeah. pay, he doesn't talk bad about stuff unless it's gaining traction. Right. You know, from you, what you know I've what? noticed, he's, he's definitely shaking things up. I, I really like that. You, you know, he made he made a lot of things interesting. He made boxing interesting again. And not only did he make boxing interesting, he got the MMA guys interested in boxing. Like he's taking them out of their game to play his game. You know, you, you know what? And it's so much so. I, I love what he's doing because. I want to come out. I want to glove up, and then I want to go punch him in the face. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I love what he's doing. Him and his brother. I, I would definitely. I'm. I'm gonna pay to watch that fight. Um, his, his brother's fighting Mayweather. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna pay for it because it's just such a show. You, you know, right, it's just, exactly. It, it. It's not something out of the normal. You know, so that that's what I really love, and I love that he's stirring things up. He has professional athletes, boxers themselves, wanting to fight him now. You know, can you imagine that? There's some, there's just some dude, you know, and I get that he wants to fight. I, you know, I understand that, but his marketing strategy, I think everything he's done about it is just genius, you know, because people are circling his orbit. You know, he's not going to them. People are coming to him. People are calling him out and you have professional boxers and professional fighters wanting to fight him. And then, you know, when that happens, you know, I think that is something special, you know, so I, I think that is absolutely something cool that he's doing yeah this guy after the the event last night you know you had Oliver and michael chandler fight and this guy asked dana white you know i heard you block gsp from boxing de la jolla on one of these trailer cards you know and dana white got really upset you know and was saying these guys call me every day i don't know why they want you know competitors from my event yeah you know what i mean but yeah you could tell it really irritated him and oh question. yeah you know, and I think I agree with you. I think trailers making it to where it's more like an event with fights. Maybe there's a little too much music. Maybe they could cut it down to maybe a couple of performances or, or one, like the Super Bowl. You know, right. have one performance. But, you know, they may have had too many last time. But I feel like it's more like a, an event that happens to have some. I would love to see De La Hoya fight someone like, I know they were talking about Eddie Alvarez and, I'd love to watch De La Hoya fight just to see if he could beat Eddie Alvarez at this point in his well, life, which I think he would have a good chance of doing. You know, a lot of people don't. I, I disagree entirely. I think even at this his advanced age, he he could he could definitely beat Eddie Alvarez or at least be very competitive with him. Are, are you talking about boxing, boxing school wise? Yeah, boxing yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, boxing. boxing, yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I think no De La Hoya would mean, still beat Eddie Alvarez today. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He would just box his ears off. Okay, so I think that skill set, it's so ingrained. You know, if you're, he's been training since he was a kid. You know, he right. was born with gloves on. You know, so I think even, I think, what is, what is he, like 47, 48? Yeah, you know, some people say because he has some, I don't know if he has some substance problems or if he's not really handling himself like a boxer. I still don't think it would matter. You know, I still yeah, think I, he would. But that's attractive. That's interesting. Let's bring in some 20-something-year-old MMA guy who has some – I think Alvarez is in his 30s, but who has some decent stand-up skill and see what De La Hoya at 48, whatever, can do against him. I think De La Hoya would still beat him. I, I think so, too. I think so, too. And then what would make it fair, though, is just to turn around and have an MMA fight, you know, so – you know, maybe one we know that be... wouldn't be competitive. That's the thing. <laughs> right. The boxing is a little more competitive. You yeah. know, even if we saw Jake Paul fight, I don't know who they would consider putting him in this time. I don't want to see a pro boxer fight him. I know what's going to happen. Yeah, me, me too. I want I, the I, magician. I want the unknown. You know what? I, I want to fight Jake Paul. I, I want to hey, say right yeah, here. I, I, I want to fight Jake Paul and hopefully he gets this message. You, you know, I'll, I'll totally just come out of retirement, glove up and, you know, punch a couple of his teeth out but you know I totally love what he's doing and I, I think Jake Paul I think he should fight DC that that's who he, that's who he should fight you know uh DC seems to have like a, a chip on his shoulder you know named Jake Paul <laughs> Diego Sanchez the UFC just cut him he's a nut you know he's out there way out there you know yeah. <laughs> and uh <laughs> You know, not the best stand-up fighter, but a guy who will throw down. That's who yeah. it should be. The next, yeah. One. You know, uh, you know what? I think that would be really entertain entertaining, just because he's so crazy. Uh, 
I don't think it, I think it'd go the way of uh, Ben Askren though. Yeah. You know, but maybe like too. in the second round, you know, because uh, that, that guy's pretty big, you know, and, mm -hmm. and he does have some skills, I, I, you know, but that would be really fun and I would pay to watch that. That is something. Yeah. I, I think if you could get Dale Long Hoy on the car versus somebody, Jake Paul versus Diego Sanchez, I think it would be a huge event. Yeah. I, I think, you know, that, that guy would be breaking some, some deep uh, pay-per-view records right there, which I already think he's in the top 10, you, you know, uh, or I think they broke some kind of record. I'm not sure, but. I and I know they have Paulie Malignaggi and Bare Knuckle. Maybe Paulie would do a thriller type, you know, fight. Yeah. Yeah, you know, did you see did you see the one where he fought the she what's his name? The the MMA guy. Uh what's his name? Yeah, you know, bare knuckle, you're allowed to hold and hit. And I think Artem Lobov was able to use that to his advantage in the fight. But I thought that's kind of where where I was going with you, right? That right. day there was no UFC event, which is pretty rare on weekends these days. And Everyone was wanting to know what was going to happen that fight. Why? You have Paul Malzanaji versus an MMA fighter. You know, if right. he was fighting Floyd Mayweather, Canelo, I mean, people would have watched it to watch Pauly get beat up. But there was genuine, okay, what's going to happen here? Is the magician going to pull this out of his hat or not? You know, what, what is he going to pull off his hat? So there was real wonder between who was going to win. I think people were on the fence because of the rules. And I was pretty surprised they even got Polly in there to do bare knuckle. I, th yeah, I thought bare too. knuckle really dropped the momentum on that because they had all those eyes. And then, then what, you know, I felt like, man, bare knuckle is really going to do something here. And then it just kind of, you know. Yeah. I mean, they, they lost a little bit of clap, you know, they could have just uh, jumped on that train and, and gone with it, but they didn't. Uh, the, the marketing team behind that was just a little slow slow to take action but yeah that death that fight right there you know i was very curious to see what happened and i definitely thought that that polly was going to win you know, i was so surprised it, it was just amazing and, and that that's a kind of curiosity that i think uh mm -hmm. you know uh, jake paul is is bringing you know all these things you know just mixing them in there that's during the pot i guess you can the say. magic act just like you had said earlier in the interview you know, right. <laughs> the magic act. You got to keep the magic fresh. Yeah. In this thriller yeah. situation, you don't necessarily, there were some people saying Ben Askren was going to beat Jake Paul. You I know? thought he was, I definitely thought he would. You know what? Uh, there's this fight. I don't know if you've seen it. It's Gina Bell. Okay. He fights uh, Milo Savage. Milo Savage was a top and world champion boxer. Okay. So uh, Gene beat him. Okay. Although he did use, he did use uh, judo to beat him. But the thing is, if you look at the fight, he used distance. He uh, neutralized Milo. And that's, what, that's a direction that I thought that, that Ben was going to go. I thought he was going to take, you know, you know, pull this number that Gina Bell did years ago and just kind of, you know, distorts the, distort the boxer's strategy. But he didn't, man. He, he just went out there and... You know, there was like no defense. And I was like, dude, what is going on here? You're, you're, what's your strategy? You know, I, I. Like I saw Henry Cejudo come on Instagram live, you know, and he has some boxing and his, you know, he was a golden glove. I think he did. And he was saying, look, you know, you guys think Tyron Woodley would beat Jake Paul. He won't. He was saying, you know, this guy's dedicated. He may be a clown, but he's dedicated himself to learning this. And. You know, Tyron with the, yeah, he has a big right hand, but if a guy's dedicate himself to learning this, he's going to be able to deal with that. There aren't a lot of guys in MMA who are going to beat him at this kind of format. No. You know, no. he said, I hate to break it to you, but he's going to beat most of the guys he boxes from MMA because they just don't have the skill. That, that is correct. I mean, he's specializing in boxing. You know, that's a special key that he's doing. You know, an MMA guy is – you know, they're rounding out the numbers here with boxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, you know, so they're not specializing in anything. And so when they meet that specialist, you know, when you go up head to head with somebody that's actually specializing in something, they're at a great disadvantage. And it doesn't matter. It does not matter who it is. It could be GSP, you know, it could be, 
he's, he's just going to fight Chavez right now. What's, what's his name? You there you go, him. too. Anderson Silva versus Chavez. Anderson Silva. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Another one. Yeah. I wish that was you on Triller. How did they let that happen? Right. You know, I, I think Anderson Silva is going to get his ears boxed off. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, I don't think, you know, I mean, it might go the distance. I just don't see him winning. And I really don't think that much of a, a, a Chavez Jr. I don't think he's a great boxer at all. I don't think, you know, he's, you know, I think he's living off the, the status of his dad. You know, that's, that's what I personally think. And I, I might be wrong, you know, but I don't think he's a great boxer. But I think he is better than Anderson Silva. I think he's going to just, you know, put a beating on him. You know, I, I, I just don't see him winning. You know, and I think a lot of these MMA guys, it, it's, you know, the, the, pay, the pay tech, you know, must be pretty good. You know, but I think also the ego, the ego is going to take a beating, you know, <laughs> along with your face. <laughs> so I find it interesting. Though. I think Triller is kind of saying we want the MMA fan. We aren't going to so have too. MMA fights, but we want this fan. We want to use some of these fighters. We want to kind of attract the MMA fan. And like you said, the unknown. I can't believe Triller didn't get that Anderson Silva Chavez Jr. That would have been perfect for one of their events. You know? Yeah, that would that would have been perfect. I, I mean, that that is something I'm looking forward to watch. You know, so uh, you know, it, it can't come soon enough. But I, I just don't see you know Anderson doing much. I don't you know I just don't see it happening. You know, but. Um, and Floyd, I mean, he fought Tenshin Nasakawa in Japan. A lot of people were interested to watch. I don't know. Some people said it wasn't real and, you know, but people were interested in seeing it because it was something different. Had he been fighting another boxer, I don't think people would have been interested in seeing it, but it was the unknown like you were talking about. Right. You know what? I felt bad, you know, because that guy was really good, but I think uh, the way the contract was set out, it really limited him on what he could use, you know, with Floyd, you know, so he basically went out there and just boxed Floyd instead of, you know, him being able to use his, his the skills, his skill set. I think if he would have been able to use his skill set that he already has, it would have been much more entertaining. I, I would have, you know, but I mean, that was just a given. That was just like a gift, you know, to Floyd, um, you know. And then I want to touch on this with this Floyd. He's fighting, uh, what's his name, Paul? Logan Paul, name? the brother. Logan Paul. Yeah. Logan Paul, the, the brother. That's a big dude. You know, yeah. I want to say that is a big dude. <laughs> you know? and young yeah and, and young that, that's correct so I, I think there's a good possibility there that you know his skill set is not going to be a Floyd Mayweather level you know but he's going to hit hard you know he's definitely going to be getting hit hard and you know if he's having a heavy guy just lay on you you know it, it's going to make a difference I, I think uh you know I'm, I'm hoping for an upset I, I'm rooting <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for the underdog yeah, I just find it fascinating that you're that interested. I am too, even though we're MMA purists, you know. Yeah, you it's, know what? it's the I, unknown element that attracts us. Right. I, I definitely look for those pookie fights, man. I, I like that. Um, I, I like that novelty. You know, I like that thing that makes you talk. And and these fights, they definitely, you know, they're water cooler talk. And I, I, that that's what I'm looking for. You know, I, I like MMA. I like MMA, you know, I like it, you know, but, you know, if it's at this point, it is no longer that interesting to me, you know, unless it's like some super fight, you know, the, the fight with John Jones, where he wants to fight the heavyweight championship, that would interest me. I would really pay for, uh, you know, pay-per-view, you know, for that, just because that's a little different variable than what just it's being fed all the time. Um, but other than that, I'm, you know, I'm always looking for those fights that, you know, that's something to talk about. And when these fights are these thriller fights, it's definitely, you know, having people talk. Yeah, maybe we'll have to bring you on. After we have the next thriller, we'll bring you on. We'll talk about it. Let's do it, man. I think that would be very exciting. That'd be so exciting to talk about, you know, just give a take and, you know, see what, see how it goes. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But, um, you know, excuse me real quick. My daughter wants to know what time we're off. Oh yeah, we can go now, man. I appreciate it. But yeah, maybe after next trailer, we'll we'll jump and do something. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to it. this. Was so much fun. Um, you know, I I just want to say, you know, I've been asked to do interviews, 
I have been because a lot of people are interested in the, you know, the NHB MMA stuff, you know, from the origins. And I've always said no. You know, I've I've never, you know, I've, I've always said no. Uh, you know, Kung Fu. I don't know if it's still around. You know, Kung Fu Magazine wanted to interview me for it, and I've always said no. I've been very private. You know, I I think, you know, everything was at the right spot. You know, so. I was a little hesitant at first. I was like, yeah, you know what? Let's just do it. It's just going to be so much fun. You know, I like it. Well, I enjoyed it. I'm glad you liked it, man. I, I thought it was great. And the trailer thing is great to end on because I'm actually really interested in it. Yeah, let's see how it goes, man. All you right. Know, well, and, uh, I appreciate it. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Todd. I really enjoy your show. I'm happy that you had me on it. And then let's talk soon, man. For sure, man. I appreciate it. Take care. All right. You too. Bye-bye.